Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you here today. You know, you can sing about the presence and the glory of God, but unless you've really experienced it, you don't know what you're missing. I was proud of a kid growing up. Had lots of, quote, fun in a worldly sense. And then I, when I got saved, I never would have ever believed that the presence of God would be like it was. And it is. And that's what transformed my life. You know, when I think about how the Lord's literal presence came upon me and He met me and a love washed over my soul that literally transformed me. Helped me to see things different. I literally went from one moment looking at things a certain way and the next moment everything was different. The sky was prettier, colors were brighter. It's just wild what God does when His presence comes. The other thing he does is he, he reveals just where you're really at. So where are you at today? You know, we, uh, last thing, you, you know me well enough now, the last thing we want to do is go through the motions of some kind of church experience, being religious, who gives a real? Right? Amen. I mean, I want the real thing. I want Jesus to walk among us. I want him to meet us right here today. Amen. And a lot of us have been distracted. By a lot of things. You're distracted, maybe now. You might even be distracted by your own thoughts of what you think church is about. And the real deal is, it's all about Jesus. Amen. It's about connecting with the King of the Universe, it's about connecting with the one who created you, formed you, has a plan for you. I mean, that's all good news to me. Instead of me stumbling through life and darkness and all the stuff I was involved in, God began to set a course. He has a course for you, too. Not just for certain people, it's for all who call upon the name of the Lord. That's the good news. And it's really about a relationship. It's about community. It's about being involved with the King and everything He's doing. There's just nothing like it. And I just want to encourage you, even as we're looking at Matthew, I'm not just trying to teach you stuff. I'm hoping to lay out things in such a way that you go, oh, wow, that's for me. I can walk in this. I can, man, I need to surrender more. I want to experience God in a deeper way. And every time the Lord comes, every time He meets with you, every time there's those holy moments, you know, where you really know God's Spirit is coming over you, you every time you get back up off that floor, you're not the same. What happens to me is, the first thing that happens is, oh, wow, I still got a lot of junk in my life. Second thing that happens is, oh, wow, God loves me more than I understood. The third thing that happens is, I want more of that. I want more of you, Lord. So, Father, we just pray in Jesus' name today. We ask in your love and in your grace and all the mercy that you have. I don't even think we can comprehend how much you really have, and it's for us. Thank you, Jesus, that we can't exhaust your grace. We can't exhaust your mercy. Your love doesn't run out for us. It's here every day. Every moment of every day, and we just need to turn towards you. Amen. And so I just pray as we study your word and understand the blessing of the, the word of God that is written, its whole purpose is to lead us into your presence, Lord, the living word. And may we experience you today. All God's people said. Amen. 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 So again, Jesus on the scene, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 23 through the end of the chapter. I bounce back and forth because certain things are left out of some Gospels, and I just don't want to miss this, because last week we were talking in, in Matthew chapter 9, you remember? And um, what was going on, there was a big party because Jesus had called Levi, who was Matthew, to come follow him, who was a tax collector, who was a Sadducee, who was one who worked with Rome, who, who the Pharisees and stuff just hated him because he, he's working with Rome, and he's a tax collector, and he collected money from them, and they... And Jesus went to his house and a whole bunch more tax collectors come and other sinners and prostitutes and everybody else comes and there's this scene and remember the Pharisees come and they're like, why is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners? You know, just the same thing happens to any of us if you're really living for Jesus and you somebody sees you walk out of a bar, you're like, Pastor David just walked out of a bar, right? And all those kind of things that happen, people immediately think the worst. And they're thinking the worst of Jesus. And Jesus is 
tells him at that point, I'm here, you know, the healthy don't need a physician. The sick need a physician. And really the sickest people in the place were the religious people who didn't see their need for Jesus. And then it goes on, and John's disciples come. It doesn't end there. John the Baptist has disciples still. They're not figuring out that John came just for Jesus to be on the scene. And, and they come, and they say, what is it that we're fasting? And you're not. And they're still keeping the traditions of their fathers, and they're still trying to live according to the law, all those kind of things. And Jesus uses a couple of illustrations. The first one is you don't take unshrunk cloth and sew it on shrunk cloth because it'll pull away and make the tear worse. And, and the second one is you don't pour new wine into old wineskins because the wineskins have already stretched and they can't stretch anymore and they will, and they'll burst, right? He says you pour new wine into new wineskins and you keep the old and the old and both are preserved. Remember what we talked about? He was saying that the law will be preserved, but this is a new covenant. This is a new day. And he's not saying that, that the law's purpose is to save you. He's saying the law's purpose is to lead you to what? Jesus. Because the law does one thing. Because you're guilty. Because I'm guilty. And I stood before a judge before on speeding ticket, and I was guilty. And it's a weird feeling, and it made me think about judgment day. If we don't have the blood of Christ covering us, you're just guilty. But Jesus is trying to tell them there's a, there's a new day. There's a new covenant coming, and I'm in. I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, I don't know if we can fully wrap our minds around that, but he took all your sin and all mine. And if he did not do that, we stand guilty, right? But he did do that. He bore the wrath, the penalty, and said it was finished. But he goes on in this text, and I love this text, and he's going a little bit further. In verse 23 of chapter 2 of Mark, it says, and it's in line of everything that was going on last week, it says, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields, so he had left Matthew's house, right? And they're passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath! Oops. It's the Sabbath day. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of the grain. You ever realize that people are always watching you? <laughs> always watching, making assumptions, and judgments. And... I Man, it happens all the time. We've all been guilty of it. That's how we know it happens all the time, right? We've all done it at some point. But it goes on here. It says the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. They had all their own rules. I mean, they made 720 other rules to somehow live according to the law. And they had rules of even how far you could walk on the Sabbath. They had rules to, you couldn't make food, but you could place food in certain places and walk to that certain spot so you could eat it on the Sabbath. I mean, they had rules for everything. And on top of God's laws, and they made all these rules so that Antinomians came about because they couldn't stand it anymore. I mean, those who, ah, ah, ah. And you know, people are doing that with the church today, too, because instead of being full of the grace of God and the love of God and helping them come to faith in Jesus, we're about telling them to straighten up, clean up, don't do that, you can't do that, you need to do this. And I'm not saying that your life shouldn't change. You know me. Your life better change if you're in Christ, and it changes because you're following the King, right? But I am saying, if we're not careful, we become just like this, somebody new comes in and the first thing you're doing is you're checking them out. Huh. Huh. He's got an earring. I wonder if it's in the right ear or the left. <laughs> oh, he's got hat to use too. Right? And so, or his hair's long, or it's short, or he's or if he's a skinhead because he shaves it. I mean, it, like Mike, you know. But anyway. <laughs> we have more assumptions than we want to admit. Right? Man, if we can let go of those, can you imagine if he could just realize that we've never been called to be the judge? Never, right? Ever. We've been called to carry the good news of Jesus Christ. He forgives. There's new life in Christ. Right? right? So, but he goes on in here, and 
I think Jesus walked along with his Pharisees and he's watching them eat and, and I think Jesus smiling because he goes, here it comes. Here it comes. It's coming. And then, so he says this to him. And so, and he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? This is how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest, and he also gave it to those who were with him. So before I go on, why did Jesus share this story? Doesn't that make you wonder? So I don't think a lot of us think like that. You just read it, go, well, it's there. It's written. I read it, go, why this one? Well, number one, is Jesus in the line of who? David, right? So he's saying, David, who's king, entered the house, who you say is the king of Judah, who you're looking for Messiah to come from, and uh, he ate the consecrated bread. So did his followers. <laughs> and I think the Pharisees are like, oh, they don't know what to say, right? But he's also, Jesus is doing something else. He's trying to tune this guy in, or the Pharisees who are around him, in to the fact that he is the line of David, who has come as the Messiah to take away the sin of the world, meaning, I am the bread of life. It's only in me that you find life. And he's challenging his thinking. He's trying to get him out of his box. We get stuck pretty tight in our little boxes. I think as we get older, it gets even tighter sometimes, right? <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, we need to always be learning and growing in our faith. Because there's, has anybody exhausted this yet? I haven't even come close. But Jesus says something here that it hits me. It says, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So before I read the last verse in this deal, and we're going to be going to some other places, he's saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So what happened is things have gotten turned around where it's all about the man and no longer about the Creator. It's all about what I do on the Sabbath, instead of being with the one who created the Sabbath. So why, why the Sabbath? Have you ever really thought about what, what was the purpose? What, what was the Sabbath about? Because it, one of the Ten Commandments is keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? What was the Sabbath all about? Most people say, well, I just got to rest from my work. Jesus already blew that out of the water earlier, saying my father hasn't rested to this day, and neither am I. So what was the Sabbath? What was it about? Because I run into people today in our culture that are still fighting over this issue. They're still saying, you got to keep the Sabbath in the legalistic sense, right? And so what happens here, and it's interesting to me because in their culture, this is something you might not know, but the Sadducees and the Pharisees had a different idea about, can you just imagine? Sabbath. Right? So one celebrated it from Friday at sunset to Saturday at sunset. The other one celebrated it from Saturday morning sunrise to Sunday morning sunrise. Can you get an idea why they could butcher all the lambs and they got butchered on different nights? That's why Jesus, even to celebrate the Actually, the Lord's Supper, the Passover, at a different night, and be crucified still on the Passover on the next night. You see how it happened? Pretty powerful, pretty cool, when you start to see it all coming together. But, so Jesus stating to them, you have made Sabbath what it was never meant to be. Sabbath was always meant for you to be in my presence. Everything we've been saying about, right? The last song, your presence, Lord. Sabbath is about being in the presence of God, meaning taking time to slow down because they all brought the Bible, right? No, they didn't. They didn't have one. Sabbath was really important back then because the only way you hear the word is by coming together because that's where it was. 
They could pull out the scrolls and read them and share. They couldn't go home and read and have devotions like we have devotions. They could go home and think about what they heard about that day through the week or whatever, but they did not have their own Bible. So those who have much will be required of much. Don't go get rid of your Bible now. <laughs> So Jesus goes on here in verse 28 and says this, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to spend a little time here. i got way too much scripture to get through everything I was thinking about today. As so time is rolling along. So it says here, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. What do you think he's saying? I mean, it's really important because if we don't understand this, we're not going to understand our rest, right? Because everything about Sabbath was about rest, which rest came from being in God's presence. Man made it into not doing anything, at least according to their way. They had ways of doing stuff because they match it up. But the truth is, it's like, it reminds me of the community, that's the Reformed community in Pella, shared this with some of you before, but really religious culture. There's first reform, there's reform, first reform, second reform, third reform, fourth reform, fifth reform, because they can't get along. So they split and just start another reform church, but it can't be reform, it has to be first reform, then it has to be second reform, then it has to be third reform. Go down the line, but they're all real religious. Everybody's in church on Sunday in this little Dutch community, and it's just, you know, 20 and some miles from where we live. So they can't work on Sunday because Sunday to them is Sabbath, which Sunday has never been Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week. But they say it's Sabbath, so you know what they can't do? Cannot wash their car on Sunday. If you wash your car on Sunday, you'll never hear the end of it. Ooh, washing your car, terrible. Do you know what they all did? They put drains in their floor in the garage. They got the garage door down and washed the car. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like what we're talking about, right? You, you think it's ridiculous, but then you have the Seventh-day Adventists, right? That's what their claim to fame is. We know when the Sabbath is. It's Sabbath. <laughs> and so they worship on Saturday because it makes them where the true people of God. Cold hell and white. But I'm not trying to make fun of them. I'm just trying to say <coughs> every different little movement, for some reason, has their little idea of what this looks like. And, and Sabbath was always about entering into God's rest. But only how the question we have to answer is how is it that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath? Now we know He's the Creator, He's God of the universe, and better be Lord of the Sabbath, but. In our mind, scripturally, for he's trying to unwrap this. But in chapter 7, <laughs> listen to what it says. So it's going to take us a little while to unwrap this. So it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, says this, To whom also Abraham apportioned the tenth part of all the spoils. So Abraham's coming back, if you remember the story in the Old Testament, and Melchizedek meets him. He knows this is an ordinary man, right? It says, was first of all, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, he made, it says, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually, meaning forever. So who is this king of Melchizedek? It's Jesus! Right? Who do you think appeared before Abraham before he went to Sodom and Gomorrah with the two angels? Who do you think Moses met on the mountain and said that he said, I am in the burning bush, I am sent me. What did Jesus say in John? He said, before Abraham, I am. He claimed the name of God. He's saying, that's me. I am. That's me. You've been talking about me for a long time. I'm here. And now I'm right here. Right? I just love it though, because it says here, let's go down. In verse 8, it says this. I don't have time to read it all. It says, In, the, in this case, mortal man received tithes, but in that case, 
one received them of whom it is witness that he lives on. I'm dying. Oh God. Go down to verse 11. So we get into this. It says, Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, which is in the line of who? Aaron, right? It's the Levi priesthood, right? In the line of Aaron. Okay? For on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? It goes on, it says, not, and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. So just understand what he's trying to say here in Hebrews is this priesthood isn't what they've been practicing all the way through the Old Testament. The line of Levi is from Aaron, okay? This is a new priesthood. That's really important to understand. Because it goes on, and listen to what it says. It says this in verse 12, chapter 7, For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. Did you hear that? When the priesthood is changed, it means the old law has to be changed to what is new today. That's good news for us. That's what I've been talking about in the, the wineskins, right? The idea that the law is so purpose, I mean, the law is good, it's perfect in the sense that there's no error in it, but it has no mercy, no compassion, no ability to forgive. The law just says you're guilty. And Jesus is coming, not only, if you remember, just got to look at it, it came from here, Matthew 5, 17. Just tie this together. Matthew 5, 17 says this. Do not think, this is Jesus speaking, right? That I come to abolish the law. Or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, if that doesn't take place, if Jesus doesn't fulfill the law, we're still under the law. Right? But he does fulfill it. So let's just go on a little bit. I want to talk about a couple things here. So listen to what it says. So I'm going to read that again. It says, For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Meaning, Jesus doesn't belong in his human ancestry that can be traced to Aaron or the Levites at all. Okay, that's what he's talking about. It says, from which no one has officiated the altar. So he's trying to say from the tribe of David, no one's ever been a priest. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So some stuff is happening here, but just a second. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law, a physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. So what is happening here is two things, and this is really, and I never really caught this until this week. And I mean, I've known this teaching, don't misunderstand me, but the full weight of what is actually being said here is saying that the Levite priesthood is no void. Now, I have no authority, no power, part of God right now. Do you understand the weight of that to those who are Pharisees and Sadducees and are walking around and they're all part of the priesthood and the Sanhedrin and everything else is there and literally Jesus has come to fully change that order and there's only one priest now and it's Jesus. There is no other priest. No Catholic priest. No Pope. And I'm not coming against Catholicism. I'm just saying, you don't have to go through a mediator because he is the mediator. You understand your freedom now that is yours in Christ because the whole order has been nullified. It's done. It's finished. Complete. Now, Matthew 17 gives us a little bit more insight. I'm just trying to decide how far I'm going to go. I might end with this today because we've got a lot to cover. I think if we don't understand this, we don't understand Sabbath. 
We don't understand the rest that's promised to us, and we're going to get to that probably next week. But Jesus in Matthew 17, uh, just before Matthew 17 and 16, promised that some of you will die before you see me in my glory. People have stumbled over this forever trying to figure out. But they did die. Jesus died. He rose. He went to heaven. And we didn't get to see that, but they did. On the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Who did Jesus take with him? Peter, who else? James and John. That was his inner circle. James and John were sons of thunder. Young bucks that had a real rowdy personality. I love that. They probably were anywhere from 14 to 16 years of age. Peter was probably 19 or 20. But that was his inner circle. They went everywhere Jesus went. They went in further in the garden. There was one up the mountain. They got to see it all. That's why I always said I want to be with Peter. I want to see it all. I want to be with Jesus. You know, I want to walk with him. But they go up on the mountain, and something really powerful happens. Jesus is transfigured in front of them, transformed. It says that he became whiter than the brighter than the sun. Think they got to see his glory? <coughs> now, some people look at that and say, well, that'd, be, that'd be really cool. I'm like, that'd be really scary. I mean, he is chained right in front of you in all his glory and purity and brightness and majesty just starts. Remember, in the end of the story, there won't be any need for a son because of what? Jesus is there in his glory. It'll be bright. It'll be a light that's going to be so powerful, so lovely. I don't know about you, but I just love every morning the sun comes up on this light. Oh, that's nice. Beautiful. Can you imagine the glory of the living son? So they're up on this mountain, and Peter and James and John are looking at each other. I mean, I don't even know what to say. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah come down. And they knew it was Moses and Elijah. So if you ever wonder, are you going to know who you are? Yes, you should know who you are. You'll be who you are. Isn't that cool? You've been glorified, right? Meaning you'll go from mortal to mortal. You won't be dying anymore. You won't be perishing. You won't have disease or sickness. All on. But they're there. And they're so overcome. Peter's the only thing he can say. And I just, this is one of those moments. Have you ever just said something because you didn't know what to say? And it was kind of, oh, yeah, they look at you like, what? Right? Peter goes, you want us to build three shelters? <laughs> Like we're going to stay on the mountain? And then Jesus looks at him and goes, Oh, man. Oh, no, it's a ghost. You know? Really? Build three shelters. And then the cloud of the living almighty God, the Father, comes over them. The, the glory is too much. The, the, actually, if you study this out, it's like they passed out. Right? Because I think that's exactly what's going to happen. And so when they kind of come through, but while this is going on, before they pass out, the glory of the Father comes over them, and he says what? He says again, what he said at the baptism, and he went a little bit further. He said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. And then he says, now listen to him. So my question forever, and I've shared this some, but I don't know if we fully grasp it at times, but why Moses and Elijah? Some people go, well, they're going to be the two witnesses up in here. They might be. I don't know. But that wasn't why they were there right now. <clears throat> why were they there? Pretty simple, really. Moses represented Mount Sinai. And Elijah represented the prophets. What is, who is Jesus fulfillment of? The law and the prophets. I never understood this forever. Because I'm always like, well, that's a cool story, but I don't get it. Right? I mean, I'd like to have been there. I'd like to have seen what they saw, but I wonder why they did that. And then he tells them, don't tell them anybody about this life of my resurrection. Because he also knew they didn't get it, and they won't understand it until they're baptized with the Spirit. Then they understood it. But it literally, Jesus' fulfillment of the law and the prophets. God the Father saying, Jesus is fulfilling. Now listen to Jesus. No longer are you to... Do you need to read this? Oh, yeah. 
know it, understand it, but this isn't what you're about anymore. You're about my, my son. Listen to my son. Because only in him, why? Only in Jesus, because he is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, will you find forgiveness because he redeemed you through what? His blood when he died on the cross. And not only did he redeem you through his blood, but he conquered the <coughs> ultimate effect of sin, which is death and punishment in hell, separated from God, he ripped down the curtain that separated man from God. So we can go in freely, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, and find help in our time of need, which is often, not every day. That's why Hebrews 12, 2 says, fix your eyes upon what? The author factor of your faith. So, just in brief, and I want to get into this more, when Jesus says, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, what is he saying? I just want to answer this question, and we're going to pray. What is he saying? What do you think he's saying? Literally, he's saying what? There's only rest if you're in me. See, rest was never a place. Rest was being in the presence of God. Rest today is about what? They had unbelief in the old days, right? So they didn't get to enter his what? Rest. Because they didn't trust God. Ooh, it's a big issue for us. When we walk in unbelief, you're not even close to entering his rest. And rest comes from having trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Not just as your Savior, but that He's Lord, He's in control. And you can trust Him. Father, I pray in Jesus' name today. As we just try to process and understand fully that you're high priest forever, and that you have no beginning of days or ending of days, because you're God Almighty, and you're the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the First and the Last. And Lord, I just thank you today that we can put full faith and trust that what you said, you will do. And we can trust you no matter what chaos, struggle, trial, temptation comes our way. That we're going to make it because we're in Christ. Lord, would you help us understand that true Sabbath is in you. True Sabbath is being in your presence. True Sabbath is because we're temples of God now, you abide in us. Have your way, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters in Christ in Jesus' name.